Welcome to the Author to Authority podcast. And today I have got a very interesting story for you. So we're going to take a little bit different look at things today because I'm going to be speaking with Fitz Kohler and she's got this incredible story of traditional versus self-publishing. Now Fitz is like a very prominent and compelling fitness expert. So yes, normally it's not the type of guests we have on the Author to Authority show, but I think when you hear what she has to say, you're going to be very, very surprised. Um, she's a race announcer in America. She's the voice of the Los Angeles Marathon. And she's also got a credible personal story, which I'm going to let her share with you. So Oh, I'm going to try to say this. She is also the head of Fitz. Fitz oh, I tried to say it slowly. <laughs> I'll let her say it. <laughs> Fitzness. Fitzness.com. Fitzness.com. Welcome to the show, Fitz. Thank you, Kim. I'm so happy to be here. And I, I love talking about publishing, self-publishing. And, you know, I find the uh, book writing and publishing uh, process very interesting, very challenging, and really rewarding. So it's it's great to rub in tennis with other professionals. <laughs> so first of all, why don't you just share a bit of your personal story with us? Because you have been going through some really incredible things, which I think is going to greatly encourage the audience today. Well, when it comes to my most recent personal story, and I'll I'll be brief, but I've spent spent my entire adult life, my and part of my youth uh, as a fitness professional, walking the walk, doing all the right things. The way I teach fitness is on mass scale. So I don't work in gyms or health clubs or do private training. What I do is TV, radio, books, magazines, online content, uh, keynotes, like a live presentation, mm -hmm. anything I can do to uh, get people to understand, make fitness understandable, attainable, and fun. So I've been doing fitness and sports on a very large scale for a very long time. And even though I was doing all the right things in February of 2019, uh, seven weeks after a crystal clear mammogram, I found a sizey tumor in my breast and um, it had already spread to the lymph nodes and it was running through me like wildfire. And um, I, I, I jumped on that. I got, uh, I literally, I got out of the shower. I felt this tumor and I'm like, damn it. I instantly picked up the phone and called my doctor. You know, so many people stick their head in the sand or they Google or cry to their mom. I just was like, let's take action. And so I spent the next 15 months underneath or enduring very aggressive cancer care, chemo, radiation, surgeries. And um, it was hard and I was brutalized, but I made some really outstanding decisions that allowed me to travel the country while violently ill, pursuing my career and um, still supporting others. And, and I still managed to have the time with my kids and, you know, and, and it was the mental fortitude and the physical know-how that really allowed me to do the things I wanted to do. So the mental fortitude was the catalyst for um, the 2020 book called My Noisy Cancer Comeback, mm -hmm. so, uh, Running at the Mouth While Running for My Life. And then um, this book, right? Ah, you can't even see it. It's my stupid background. Trust me, it's a good book. Um, it's called Your Healthy Cancer Comeback, Sick to Strong. And so that's where I use my fitness expertise and my street cred to guide other patients. So A, we can slow their decline and B, help them out of cancer and help them getting back to um, real life and, and feeling healthy, energetic, athletic. And there's a journal that goes along with that. So that's my brief story. I'm doing well. I'm 100%. I'm, I'm dinged up from cancer, but I'm noisy as ever. And these books have been a real way to make lemonade out of my lemons. <laughs> oh, Fitz, I love it. Uh, you know what I loved about your story was the fact that even though you were going through something that would take most people down. Yeah. You said, okay, let's deal with this, but I'm not stopping I'm not stopping living during this process. I'm going to live life to the fullest I can while I do these treatments. And I love that about your story. Well, it's interesting. The culture now since uh, 2020 has been duck and hide and everybody isolate. And boy, do I think that's devastating on a person's, their psyche, their body. Mm -hmm. There is no, there are no healthy outcomes to isolation there are no healthy outcomes to constant rest. And, and the reality is, is when you're sick or when you've had surgery, you have to rest. And there's compassion and, and realistic 
lately, I had to do a lot of resting too. But when I could do something, I did do something. Yeah. And that's that's really where people need to understand is, do I need to stay in bed right now? Or can I get my can up and go do something to benefit me? And, and I did that. I, I did it all the time. Maybe I pushed it a little too hard on occasion, but I don't regret it one bit. You know, it's funny you talk about that because um, like uh, last year I had to have a very, oh, a very strong feminine procedure, not, you know, not a hysterectomy, but it's right. the next worst one to it. And, you know, they said, oh, it'll take a couple of days. No, it took me a few weeks to really feel back to myself again. And, you know, like I was doing stuff like I, I didn't stay in bed all day, but there were times my body was saying, Kim, you know, you've just had a major procedure. Yeah. And uh, maybe you should just slow down a little bit today. And it was it was learning to listen to my body. That's the secret is knowing when to say when. And sometimes, you know, are you lying in bed because you're depressed? You know, is there yeah. a physical thing holding you back or are you just bummed out? And, it, you know, staying in bed makes it worse. If you get out, get some fresh air, play with your dogs, you know, spend some time with a a buddy, a family member, watch a movie outside the house. You know, there's, it's knowing when to know when. And uh, that's, that's what the, this recent books, the recent books, your healthy cancer come back on the journal are about is getting people to take control where they can be active when they can to the level they can. And, you know, if you can, you know, go running during cancer care, great. And a lot of people do, you know, but someday maybe your cardio will be just walking once down the hallway of your hospital floor and that's okay too. stand up sit down that might be your uh, your exercise for the day or stretching in the shower so uh that's that's it's a message that's not getting out there and i'm so fortunate the books just came out and already oncologists are ordering ordering them in bulk for their patients which says everything i need to know about the future success of these books wow you know the other thing you said about covid and isolation it, it got me thinking um, this will episode will come out in April, but we're recording it in February. And a couple of weeks ago, I actually went to Podfest in Orlando. Yeah, so I yeah. got on a plane. I went. I traveled, and you know, it was one of the best things. I last year in 2022 in Canada, I could have gone to in-person events, but I made the conscious choice not to because my daughter-in-law was pregnant. And I didn't want to risk bringing something home to her. Personally, like if I got COVID, I didn't care. Like, you yeah. know, it didn't. I wasn't afraid of it. You know what, Kim? We've spent our entire life going out and on occasion getting germs and getting sick and then yeah. getting over it, right? We we never feared. We never hid before, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I just, I felt really strongly in this case that, um, that I wanted to be careful for my daughter-in-law. Yeah. Because, you know, when it's just you and you get sick, okay. But when you're pregnant, it's a whole different story, right? And, and the consequences. So I didn't do any in-person events in 2022. So it had been three years since I had done any in-person events, like a lot of Zooms and all that kind of stuff. So I had decided that I was going to a conference. I went to a big, huge conference with lots of tons of people and energy and good training and teaching and... Um, you know, as an extrovert, that just kind of revived my soul. It does. Yeah. You know, yeah, but well, my husband's the opposite. He's an introvert. For him, being at home and just having that quiet time at home revives his soul when he's been around too many people too long. Yeah. It's a, it's a balance, right? You got to have balance. That's why he didn't come with me. <laughs> good, for, good for both of you. Good for both of you, Kim. <laughs> All right. I want to start to shift things over here. Um, talk about your traditional versus your self-publishing book experience. Okay. So uh, you know how uh, the, the rule is in traditional publishing, you can't have a book until you have a book, right? You can't get an agent until you've already published a book. So there's all these catch 22s. So I was very fortunate. Maybe 15 years ago, I got an agent, uh, a New York agent. I live in Gainesville, Florida, which is a small town in the Northern half of Florida, not ripe with literary agents, but I think <laughs> a friend connected me with one and I liked her and uh, she started pitching me and, and having me write pitches and so forth. And one day she came to me and said, Fitz, um, 
Adams Media would like you to write the Everything Flat Belly Cookbook. Are you interested? And I thought, well, I could do that. And she said, um, you know, here's your deadline. We're, they're going to pay you $10,000 up front and that'll be a flat fee. And I thought, well, hot damn, that'll be great. Yes, first book and they're going to give me $10,000. I don't have to worry about it. I wasn't going to get any residuals, but that was a fine deal for me. I was young. And so I wrote that book. It did well. It, they were very pleased with my efforts and I was pleased with working with them. And so soon after they came to me with another proposal and said, can you write 365 ways to boost your metabolism? Sure. So they paid me in advance and um, write the book and I submit it. I submit it and I get a a um, response that says, hey, we want to add two chapters. Now, let me preface this by saying I'm an actual fitness expert. I have a master's degree in extra sports, exercise and sports sciences. I've been teaching for decades and I've never once lied to the general public to make a dollar. I do not promote diets. I do not promote pills, powder, weight loss supplements, any of those things. In fact, I am a vehement opponent of those things that you know, take full advantage of people who just want to be healthy, right? So those yeah. things are not okay. So they came back and said, we want to include two chapters in your book. Number one on negative calorie foods, suggesting that if you ate, say, raspberries, for example, you would burn more calories digesting those raspberries than you did consuming them, which is false. It's lies. <laughs> and there's cabbage. Cabbage is the big one. Yeah, but uh, crap. It's just not a thing. And then also, oh, and they had dozens of foods. It was a big chapter. And then they had another chapter on weight loss supplements people should take. And I came back and I said, absolutely not. These things are lies. They're inaccurate. And um, I can't be a part of that. And they said, well, we need to keep them, these chapters in the book, because people will buy the books because of them. And I said, but they're harmful. They're dangerous. It's not okay. And they said, that's okay. We want them. And I said, well... I am not okay with a book with that, those lies, having my name on it. And they said, okay. And so they removed my name and they hired some hack nutritionist who was willing to lie to people, included those ugly chapters and published the book. And I yeah. was livid. I was so livid. Because you had written it. Because, yeah, I mean, I put, I mean, they even said, we know they're lies, but people will buy it. Which is the uh, which is the worst part of the fitness industry? So if you know if you're out there and you've ever been taken advantage of a by a food that says weight loss or diet or uh, someone selling you a diet or shakes, I'm so sorry those people harmed you. But um, this is what's going on. This is the ugly side. It's the ugly side of fitness. Ugly side of publishing. So they um, took that. So then I go to my literary agent. I said why, and she said, well, in the contract you are listed as freelance writer and not author. She said, if you were listed as author, you would have final say over the content. But mm -hmm. since you're listed as freelance writer, you don't. So I said, okay, thank you for explaining it. You're fired because you should, yeah. have that. You should not have put me in this position. So there I was with no literary agent again in Gainesville. So um, took a break and focused on other parts. You know, I have a booming keynote speaking career and race announcing, and I do all of these other things. And then when cancer came around and you know, my, my, my experiences were so wild when I, when I finally started saying, okay, you should write a book like this. These stories are too cockamamie and crazy and funny. And then the ability to help people was too strong. So I thought, okay, I got to write a book. And I, I considered traditional publishing, but then I just thought, hell no, because this was very important content I was going to be providing. And it was my personal story and I didn't want to turn over control to anybody to manipulate my story. And then the other thing is, man, publishing houses take forever. I didn't want this thing to um, be sat on for three years. You know, I was just, I was coming out of chemo myself. I started writing the book halfway through my treatment. So it just was fresh. And I knew that mm -hmm. this was something I needed to take control over. And so that's when I started, I, I reached out to some friends who'd done um, self-publishing. I looked to Julie Broad with Book Launcher. She mm -hmm. has millions of wonderful little YouTube videos mm -hmm. helping a, a self-publish an author get through self-publishing. And, you know, I took it on myself and I really took on the uh, mindset that I wanted my book to be able to sit between George Bush's and Michelle Obama's on a shelf 
and people think they were from the same publisher. So high quality. I hired the cover designer. I hired, I hired the editor and the proofreader and the layout designer and professionals to make it look great. And you know, was it uh, was it hard for sure? But it was so much less hard than cancer. And these books have been so successful. And I love the fact that you know when money comes in, I don't have to give it to anybody else, right? I'm not getting yeah. a pittance of my book book uh, profits. I'm getting them all. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, how about that for a, a self-publishing versus traditional story? Oh, you know, I've, I've talked, many people have asked me about traditional publishers because I'm a hybrid. Okay. Yeah. So we do all the work, but our clients self-publish their books. Okay. Um, as at RTI publishing, we take how we have no copyright on our clients' books and we have, we take no royalties. That's like Julie's because book. Yeah. I'm an entrepreneur. First and foremost, I'm an entrepreneur. And, you know, I teach about authority marketing. And one of the things about authority marketing is, is if you're going to publish a book, you need to have 100% control of that book. Yeah. So you can do with that book what you need to do with that book to promote yourself and promote your business and not be held back by somebody who says, well, I don't like that idea. Yeah. And so, you know, that's something that's, um, I'm not, I can't say I'm the only company, but I'm one of the few who don't take royalties or copyrights because I want you as the client to be successful and to use that book as that tool that you need to just to skyrocket you up. Right. And so, you know, when you, when I hear stories like yours, it just frustrates me to all get out. Cause, and I've told people, I've told people the truth about traditional publishers and you know, you were one of the lucky ones. You had a literary agent. You had someone who could promote you to them. Most people never even get to the traditional right. publishing. They spend all this time. And then by the time they're done, the, the publisher has changed their book so much. It's not theirs anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I couldn't even fathom going traditional publishing. If I were to do traditional, I would have this rock star contract that basically said, I'm in control of everything. <laughs> And you guys, yeah. can have, you know, you can uh, provide some of the professional services and marketing, but yeah, I'm not, I'm just not willing to give it up. And, you know, I built a brand. I've been in business for decades mm -hmm. now. And uh, it's really important to me that uh, number one, people trust me. And if I would have gone along with that, uh, those lying chapters, my business would have been destroyed. I would have been like every other, you know, uh, two-bit fitness professional with no certification or, or some Cracker Jack box certification. Instead, I'm a legitimate authority that Fortune 500 companies mm -hmm. reach out to and say, please get on our stages and, and tell people what they need to know. Uh, I think it would have devastated my business had I yielded to uh, that publishing company. So I, I really want people. The other thing is I have... Um, I mean, everyone says, I'm going to write a book, right? I mean, you hear it all the time. I got a book. I'm going to write a book. And then to actually do it is such a big accomplishment. But one of my friends, she's so nice. She's at the gym. She She's written some fiction books. And she just is so desperate to go traditional publishing that years have gone by. And nobody's read one word of her great stories because she's unwilling to do self-publishing. She thinks it's inferior and... I think it's just the opposite. I think it's just well, the opposite. See, people have this perception, and I say perception um, purposefully. Yeah. They have this perception that if they get this publisher, the publisher is going to market their book, the publisher is going to sell their book. No. no. The thing is, you still have to market and sell your book. I mean, unless you become someone, you know, like all those famous ones, right? Um, you, you still have to market your own book. You have to sell your own book and 95% of it goes to the publisher. Yeah, that's it. You're, you're doing all this work and now you're getting 50 cents a book. Some of my books I make 14, $17 on. That's nice. I'd much rather yeah. make $14 a book than 50 cents. Yeah. Like if they were doing all the marketing, if they were promoting your book, if they were getting you out there, yeah. I could see that, but all the only benefit you're getting is a little check mark that says I've been published by a traditional publisher. Yeah. And the truth is nobody cares these days. No, no. 
No, it's um, it's the quality of your book that matters. Yeah, I I do think traditional publishing is probably struggling right now because there it's too easy for you and I to create beautiful products. I wish this one could be, seen. oh, there it is. It's <laughs> the stupid background. You know what? I'm removing this background. Is that going to ruin your video? If I no. remove my background? Yeah, Not at all. Crazy. Um, yeah. We're going to see my hotel room, guys. I am in a hotel room and I'm going, with, boom, there you go. All right. Much there better. Um, yeah, this is my book. I have, and this is just the paperback, but I'm so happy. Look at that. This is it's amazing. beautiful, right? It's so pretty and it's full color. You know, I got to make that choice. I said, I'm, I'm putting photos in. I want it to be happy. I'm dealing with cancer patients. All the cancer books are so flipping macabre and sad and dreary and all the ribbons and the bald heads. You know what? I was super bald. Fine. We don't need to harp on that color cheerful. Do you think a traditional publisher ever would have given me this for cancer? No, 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 no. Well, I do it myself. And I think that's, that's the point, even as a fiction. Okay. Now I don't do fiction, but yeah. even as a fiction, you know, get your book out there. Yeah. Here's the thing you want. You want a traditional publisher. I'll tell you how to get a traditional publisher self-publish your book, sell a whole whack of companies, and then a traditional publisher will come after you. Yes. Yes. That other catch 22. I mean, we were talking about what, what tra traditional publisher is going to market the hell. Well, if you're Matthew McConaughey, right, they are going to market your book. If you're yeah. uh, the hair, Harry, the spare, the spare, right. They're going to market your book. But if you're not an A-list celebrity, if you haven't been in some sort of uh, controversial, you know, maybe you were, you know, baby Jessica, you dropped in the in the well type thing. But unless you've got a massive audience that they think, hey, all these people are naturally going to buy his book or her book, they're just there's no benefit to you. Um, yeah, and and there's so many wonderful resources. You're providing great resources. I use Julie. I'm now going to start digging through your channel to keep the good information coming. But there's there's so many wonderful resources that anybody, if they spend the time learning from the experts, they can accomplish this or they can they can write the book and hire someone like you to take care of the things that they're not expert in. Yeah. Genius. Yeah. Like, here's the way I think about it. Okay. You could wait years for a traditional publisher to find you, rework your book and do it. Yeah. Or you could spend those years writing your books, building that email list building that audience, yeah. building that social media, right? The thing is, is that either way, you're going to have to build those things. Yeah. So my philosophy is why just don't self-publish. Now, don't get me wrong, okay? I have seen some horrible yes. self-published books. Yes. The, goal, the goal is to create excellence. So are you going to have to put out money? Yes. Yeah. So here's the areas where you put out money. You put out money for editing. Yes. Okay. Unless, unless, unless you have a best friend who is an English major like I do. Okay. She was the first editor at RTI Publishing with my best friend. She was an English major. Okay. She can edit. Uh, but, you know, either find someone in your circle of influence who you can pay a little bit to, who would love to edit your book, who's going to be honest, you know, not slash it, but be honest. But, you know, the other areas. You, you know, people judge a book by its cover. Yes. I, I don't care what other people say, but when they're on Amazon, when they're in a bookstore, not it's harder to get in bookstores, but let's say even on Amazon and all the other, um, you know, booksellers, online booksellers, you can't tell me that you haven't gone on Amazon and judged a book by its cover. For sure. So invest, invest. Okay. So Go now, on. if if you're predominantly text and, you know, like your book's different, it's a lot of graphics and that, that's, that's mm -hmm. a whole different beast. But people don't realize if your book is predominantly text, you can format it in Microsoft Word. It's not hard to do. In fact, I'm going to be really? this year releasing a course on how to format your right. book in Word while okay, you're working on it. Okay. We format at RTF Publishing, we format our books in Microsoft Word. Okay. 
Okay. Now the Kindle books, we use the Kindle create, but it comes from the word document. The print books are PDFs based on the word document. Wow. And one of the reasons we've done this, and it was very specific for our clients, our clients don't know how to use all these weird, wacky softwares that are out there. And I mean, they're amazing. But you know, when I send my client all the final copies, what if something happens to me? Now, at RTA Publishing, if you're my client, you come back to me, you say, Kim, we need some changes. I just make the changes, they're done, we upload them, boom, bam, finished, right? But what if something happened to me? So we files. create our books in Word so that the clients can go back and make changes if they so choose to. And they've got files that other people can work from should okay. something happen to me. So now, so I'm not planning on going anywhere anytime soon. I, hey, I didn't plan on getting cancer. But you never know what life's going to hand you. Yeah. Yeah. And you could be struck by lightning. I'm a Floridian. I think it could come any day now. So, yeah, you're right. Those are very sensitive. It's just interesting to me how many um, self published authors are afraid to ask for those things. Well, yeah. will they give me the file? Well, we'll maybe just put in a contract in advance. But I mean, what value does a designer have on your product? after it's published, you know, I'm, I, I I've hired what, you see, what they want is they want more money from you. Well, right. So right. they hold on all to that stuff. And every time you want changes, they charge you for it. See, right. I don't charge my client. Okay. There's a difference between Kim, we got to fix up a couple of paragraphs or a couple of words or this couple of typos. Okay. That's done for free. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if we're rewriting the book or doing major edits or things, okay, yeah, there may be additional charges and we talk yeah. about it. I don't just hand someone a bill. We have a discussion about it yeah. because now I'm, you know, I'm paying out, you know, my staff significant amounts of money to make these changes. So, you know, but if it's something quick and easy, we're just going to do it. We're going to take care of it for you, you know, and get it done. But that's why people do it because they want to be able to charge you more money later down the road because right. when you need changes. See, we don't do that. We hand all of our clients the source files. So a word to everybody is when you choose somebody to design your book or lay out your book or design your cover, ha make a little contract and it doesn't need to be fancy. It doesn't need to come from a lawyer. You can just say, I'm agreeing to pay you X, Y, Z for you to complete my cover design. You're going to work on it until we're both satisfied, not three, three versions. You just, they're going to satisfy you. And then when you're done, they're going to give you the raw files. Okay. Now, just in case you're not aware, in terms of your cover, your raw file needs to be in .psd or .ai format. Those formats are adjustable. If someone says, oh, I'll give you these source files and they're the PNGs, the JPEGs and the PF PDF. Yes. You can't adjust those. Right. Yes. So make sure that you you qualify what the source files are. <laughs> you are right. You are absolutely right. Um, yeah. You see, like I'm a, I'm a different type of publisher. Well, I, love I, it. I, I believe in empowering. Yes. Well, you know what? People are paying you up front for you to provide this wonderful service. And then it's their responsibility to make the income moving forward. And you want that for them. If they're successful and profitable with their um, books, that uh, then, they, then they'll come back to you, hopefully, for number two. So um, on the cover design, it's interesting. I have a friend. Oh, my gosh. So uh, she, I don't really know her too well. I know her. She's one of the runners that... I know through running, but we're not very close, but she wrote some sort of business book. It's designed, you can tell the design, very thoughtful, pretty pretty font, pretty text. And then she put a picture of herself on Now, As you know, your photo isn't usually recommended on a business book unless you are someone, people, like if you're Elon Musk, perhaps, right? Other than that, your photo is not gonna sell books, but she put a photo and she's a pretty lady, but it's so grainy. It's, it's so grainy. And um, so she put on social media, hey guys, what do you think of these covers? And her friends were like, that one's great or this one. And I just on the down low on the side said, hey, uh, do you have a photo that's less grainy? She just ignored it and she published it. And it, it's a bit of a mess. It's just a bit of a mess, which is tragic because I'm, I'm sure her content is probably fantastic. So um, that was another lesson. I think it's a hard lesson learned. 
by watching somebody else do the wrong thing. Um, yeah. I'm wishing her tons of success. She's probably going to have to, she'll probably figure out and redo that cover someday, but, but please don't make that mistake again. If you're putting your photo, make sure your photo is necessary or, or beneficial, right? And then make sure your photos are crisp. Yeah. So if you're not aware, crisp means it has to be 300 dots per inch, DPI. So if you, there's a free program called um, Ear Fan View. I R F A N V I E W. Don't know if you can get it on P on um, Apple's, but you can get it for PC. Okay. And just be careful where you get it from. Get a reputable. It's a free little photo editing software. It's been around forever. It'll tell you how many DPI your picture is. Wow, great! And you can adjust it to 300 DPI. It's grainy because it doesn't have enough dots per inch. If, if you're printing anything. You need at least 300 dots per inch to game for it to be clear. Anyway, that's just a little insider secret for Great all pointer. of you guys. Great pointer. Um, you know, like even if, let's say you're doing a chapter book, you know, like you're you're doing a chapter in in, in a, what we call a compilation book, you know, many co-authors, yeah. and you're getting your picture done, make sure that the copy that you give to the publisher is 300 DPI. I usually do 400 just to be on the safe side because sometimes 300 won't pass exactly. So make it a little higher. Let them shrink the photo, but it's hard for them. They can't expand it once they've been given something low resolution. Yep. Yep. Oh, Fitz, this has been a wonderful conversation. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. If people have enjoyed this conversation and, you know, they say, I really want to find out more about Fitz, how can they connect with you? Well, I, I used to have the logo over my head, but uh, fitzness.com is my home base for everything. That's F I T Z is in zebra, N is in Nancy, E S S.com. There you go, back there. Fitzness.com. So there's tons of free resources for anybody. Uh, most importantly, trying to get healthy and fit recipes, videos, all sorts of free, free guidance for you. Um, my books are all on sale at fitness.com. My noisy cancer comeback, your healthy cancer comeback and the healthy cancer comeback journal are there. I have online courses, things like that. Um, every book. So I also sell via all the major retailers, Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and I have audio book for my memoir, but I love connecting with my readers, especially with this topic. I, it's every day I have someone reach out and say, my dad was diagnosed with brain cancer. They need your book. Can you get it ASAP? So I actually love the process. I sign 100% of the books that leave my office. They all come with a free gift. I package them all beautifully so my readers know they're loved. And I just think it's a little extra fun. Again, especially because I'm dealing with cancer. Um, I want, I want those recipients to be happy. I want it to yeah. be filled with valuable information, but joy. So fitness.com. And then I'm at fitness everywhere on social media. And again, I, I pr promise high quality content in exchange for the like but, or follow. But what I prefer is for you to reach out and say, hey, I heard you on Kim's podcast. And these are my thoughts on this because I would much rather have friends than followers. So fitness everywhere. Love you. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. This has been Fitz Kohler and Kim Thompson Pinder on the Author to Authority podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you on the very next episode. Bye now.